Charles. Um, he's been treated at Mopac in, Johannes in, in Johannesburg, but, but is not in hospital. Um, they're looking at the two options. One is his heart, and the other one is the cancerous uh, prostate. And they seem to think that um, they'd have to treat the, the, ca the cancer first prior to doing anything to the heart. He's in good spirits. He's, he's staying in a lodge. Uh, tomorrow they have the final tests to decide what action they're going to be taking. So that's, that's the update from Charles. And I'm pretty sure you, know, you keep him in your prayers um, because it's going to be a long haul for that poor guy. Chairman, we, as, as you mentioned, we traveled, we traveled the country two weeks ago. Uh, we dressed something like just under a thousand farmers virtually and, and uh, physically. The big issues that were, were of concern to most of the members was Zedera. Zedera is, is an issue that farmers were concerned that by lifting it, it could play into the hands of government. We went at length to, to emphasize that what we were trying to do with Zedera is to soften the Zedera Act to allow us as farmers to access compensation. As it stands at the moment, we're not, we're not getting that because every IFI just blames the dairy. We said we can't do, our hands are tied, we can't do anything as long as the dairy is still there. So the plan then, and I repeat this, and probably most of you know about it, is not at this stage, and hopefully at any stage, to sue the American government. It's definitely unconstitutional under American laws. That, that, there's no doubt about that. And there this certainly seems to be a case. The objective here is to do a white paper. We've already done the letter to the Treasury. We've had the response. They blame Zedera for not being able to help us. So a white paper is to be presented to the executive of whichever government's in place after the November elections. And based on that response, a decision will be made whether we take it, take it any further or not. Taking it further, I think, is going to be a hard call. Um, and they are of a belief that once everything is presented in a white paper to the executive, there might be a softening of attitude. It's a long way down the road. I don't know whether we can succeed, but we, we'll see. The other issues was the extension and um, the... Um, Extension, uh, the extension of the of the um, deed. It expired on the 29th of July. Government's under pressure. They want us to give them an extension. We we couldn't give them that extension until such time as they put an offer on the table. The offer is on the table, and I've, I'm sure most of you know about it. The objective here is not to go to the full full period. They're offering 35 million for the first three years and a, and a bulk payment of 300 million, or just under 300 million for the fourth year. But they believe that they can address these issues prior, within that, that four year period. In other words, they can satisfy their arrears, their arrears issues. Hopefully, we'll have some response on the, the DARA issue. And they believe that they can pay the, the full payment or make, make, make the full payment. They have put a bond in there. And that has caused a lot of concern amongst the farmers. And nobody is very keen to take on a bond at 1% interest over a 20-year period. We got hold of Aaron Fox in, in Washington. They have now put a, pa a paper together which will be an addendum to the deed agreement. We got it yesterday. John Reed Rowland is going through it at the moment. Uh, there were a few issues that, needed, that were of concern to us, but until John's gone through it, um, I don't think we can discuss it at this stage. They have protected us on the bond issue and the other issues that we've raised. So I'm comfortable from that aspect. We now need to sit down with government and, and get them to agree to this. If they agree to the, to, to the addendum, we will then present it to all the farmers in a final document and we'll go to a resolution. I need to state, and it's been 
it's been quite difficult because nobody is bound, and we've, we, we've emphasized this at every meeting, nobody is bound by the, either the deed or this new offer. It is entirely up to every individual to decide for themselves whether they want to partake in this or not. And I have a lot of guys coming saying, oh, we're not interested. I said, fine, you know, then you're out of it. You know? Wait for the bigger picture. You, know, you don't have to partake. It's an interest payment, the 35 million. You don't have to sign your deed of sessions, so you're not, you're not uh, prejudiced in any way. In the fourth year, if government performs, it will, it will have to pay the, the 295 million. They say they're going to raise that through selling assets. Kavimba is one of the assets they want to sell. There's a problem with Kavimba, and you know, I'm going to set up a meeting with Andy and Kavimba um, to get a valuation, because the valuations we've been given certainly sound excessive. But if they're true and, and we can sell, then we'll sell and take, take our money. I had a meeting yesterday with uh, New State Partners. Uh, it was very good. And you're all aware of IOTA. I think we've discussed it at the meetings. They, they are being pushed hard by Ministry of Finance to get this, off, off, to get this ball going. They have spoken to two international banking associations who have expressed interest in getting on board on this issue. If that, if that happens, and it's not going to happen tomorrow, it's, it's, going to take, it's going to take time. If that happens, I believe that that's the best option for us to be compensated. Um, he did emphasize, and I told him I was going to brief, brief, you, uh, brief the farmers on this issue, and he did emphasize that it's not going to be, ha not going to be a, a short-term solution, it's going to be a long-term. Once it, it, has been, it has been agreed upon, and the fees have been agreed upon, they then have to raise a bond internationally with these two institutions to be able to raise the funds to be able to pay the farmers. That's basically where we are, Chairman. I'll take any questions if there are. You any? Anybody uh, have a question for Charlie um, that they would like to ask? I mean, sorry, Harry. Harry. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody happy? No questions, no comments. Good. Geez, you're getting off light, Harry. <laughs> it's the next meeting. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Harry, thank you very much for updating us. And that, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to the end of the closed session of uh, this, the 79th Annual Congress uh, of, the, of the Commercial Farmers Union. And Harry, thank you for making that short and sweet. We've almost caught up to our original time now. <laughs> thank you. Um, so... Um, Without. <coughs> yeah. Uh, at the last meeting we had, they said they would make the payment before the end of the month. Uh, I haven't spoken to them. S um, sorry, Harry, maybe if. Um, you want to just talk into the mic so that. Yeah, at, at our last meeting with the... Sorry, the, so just the question, the question was what's happening with the second part of the IR3 payment, which amounts to a, a total amount of 1.5 billion. The first tranche that was paid out was 1 billion. Yeah, they, they assured us that they're going to make that payment before the end of the month. We're the 29th today, I think. Um, I'll get all of them. But it has been budgeted for. Andy has written a letter to the Ministry asking for the $2 billion that wasn't drawn down on last year to be allocated. We'll see whether they accept that, but if they do, then there's another 3.5 to be due. But let's concentrate right now on the, on the 1.5. Okay. Sorry? So maybe before we um, break for tea, I'd just like to comment. Part of the challenge we have in dealing with this whole uh, global compensation agreement and the deed and the options that are available to us is that we are very eager to maintain the – keep the doors open for us to be able to access these interim relief payments, which are absolutely essential for the survival of some of our members. 
And while we do have the option of closing the door on the deed and saying government hasn't performed and we're going to arbitration, that would close the door firmly on any future IR payments on um, even and, and the US dollar cash payment that is being proposed by government. So our aim and what we are working towards and making progress on is the, the aim with this latest offer from government to make sure that funds are continuing to flow in the form of IR payments or interest payments on what is due to us, but at the same time not locking any of us into a long-term drawn-out 20-year bond structure that would be is totally unacceptable. Um, even at a good interest rate, it would be very difficult for us to accept that, especially given the fact that it's uh, not backed by any sound international finance, financial institution. So that is what we're working at, and that is what we are making progress on. And um, Harry alluded to some meetings that he's had. So the ball is, is moving slowly, and um, we will keep everyone thoroughly informed, and um, no one uh, will be our aim is that no one will be prejudiced in the long term by anything that is that that is agreed to. So, thank you. Um, any comments just on that, on anything that we've dealt with in this meeting? Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, there's um, the opportunity for us to have some more tea and uh, refreshments uh, before we begin the open session hopefully by 11.15. It's almost 11 o'clock now, so I think if we aim to start the open session in about 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat>
Everybody say what they want to put I just don't want to say something like, you've got a problem, 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 you've got a probl
but gratefully accepted the gift because some people have to accept gifts from their aunts. So the violin remained with this young boy who grew up and eventually he got married. His wife discovered the violin and uh, she thought to herself maybe it would be really nice to learn to play this. Her name was Teresa Salvato. Teresa started taking lessons and then one day in the spring of 1994, 27 years after the violin had been found on the side of the road, Teresa decided to take the violin to a repairer for a tune-up. If anybody had asked Teresa how much she thought the violin was worth, she would have replied that she had absolutely no idea. The reason she had no idea of the value of the violin was because she didn't know anything about it. The violin repairers quickly realized that the violin Teresa had brought him was not an ordinary violin. It was a very special instrument, so special that it even had its own name. The name of the violin was the Duke of Alcantara. And that was the name that had been given to it 267 years before by the person who'd made it, a man by the name of Stradivarius. If anybody knows anything about violins, they will know what a Stradivarius is. Teresa had no idea that the violin on which she had been learning to play was a Stradivarius and worth over a million dollars and had been found on the side of the road. Apparently, it landed there because in 1967, the second violinist of the orchestra of the University of California had pleaded to use the violin in a concert and had then placed the violin on the roof of his car and accidentally driven off, forgetting it was there. Stradivarius violins remind us that some things in life are special. Some things in life are significant. Some things in life require us to treat them with care and dignity. But what is it that makes something significant? What is it that makes something valuable and special? In short, what is it that makes you special? In a world of seven billion people, what makes your life significant? So we can know the value of a violin based on the identity of the instrument. We can know the identity of the instrument based on its origin. Could it be the same for us? If so, then our value as human beings cannot be understood without reference to our true identity. And our identity cannot be understood with reference to our ultimate origin. But if this is true, what happens if we lose connection with our identity, with who we really are, and our origin, where we really came from? What happens so often today is that we get confused over who we are based on what we do. Our identity comes from our function, and our value comes from how well we perform in that function. So I know that most of you here are farmers. That's not who you are. It is what you are. If we remove God from society, then we have no framework for understanding our human dignity or our essential worth. And this is what society is doing increasingly. For the atheist who believes that there's no creator God, there is nothing more to reality than a pure physical universe. Everything we are, everything we do, everything we think and feel is fundamentally just a physical process playing out on a complex system of cause and effect. In three accounts in the New Testament, in the book of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus was questioned about taxes. Asking for a denarius, he asked them to say whose image was on the coin. It was Caesar's. Soon there will be new English coins with the image of King Charles III on them. In Genesis chapter 1, um, many of you will be familiar with these two verses, verses 26 and 27. It says this, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. We, 
bear the image of God. We are his image bearers. For him, we gain our identity, sorry, from him, we gain our identity and our worth. Our function comes from what he places in us, not what he makes us look like. Today, as we proceed with the Congress, let us not forget that our identity comes from God and God alone, our creator, the one who made us in his image, the one who knows us intimately, the one who knows us by name, like the Duke of Alcantara. Once we are aware of this, our essential value comes from who and whose we are, not what we do or how well we do it. When we know our identity, our motives, reason, and purpose behind everything we do becomes less about ourselves and more about the bigger picture. The playing of a Stradivarius honors its maker. Let us honor our maker by playing our lives the way he designed them. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to meet together, to discuss important uh, part of life in Zimbabwe, an important part of our lives. We pray that as we discuss, as we talk, as we deliberate over issues that are facing us, that you give us wisdom, give us peace, give us guidance, and remind us constantly that we are your image bearers, not only to each other, but also to this nation. And we pray your blessing on us and on the proceedings today. In Jesus' name, amen. So without any further ado, I'd like to call on Andy Pascal, okay, to give us his 2022 report. Andy? Thank you, Sam. Past presidents, Trustees, councillors, invited guests, farmers and friends, both here present or joining us via the online platform. It is a great honour and privilege for me to address you and present my report at this, the 79th Annual Congress of the Commercial Farmers Union of Zimbabwe. And I would like to thank each of you for making time in your busy schedules to be a part of our proceedings today. 2022 has been a year of highs and lows for us at the CFU. And if I'm honest, I would have to say mostly lows. Um, we did have some positive um, reporting on the financial side from our auditors, which is encouraging. But the finances are not everything. It's certainly the, the personalities and the staff and the people we work with that are the most important part of everything we do and the people we serve and uh, are working so hard to represent. Soon after we returned from the Christmas break in January, Mike Clark, our acting director, suffered a stroke. Thankfully, it was not fatal and Mike is still with us and able to be with us today. We're very grateful that you're still here, Mike. This did, however, result in a period of, of time in hospital for Mike and an ex extended period of recovery. It also left him with no option but to retire from the CFU. Mike's involvement in the CFU began in 1997 when he was elected chairman of the Monesi Farmers Association. Shortly afterwards, he was elected to the post of regional chairman, a position which he only recently retired from. In 2007, Mike began his full-time employment with the CFU, and for much of the last 15 years, he has worked quietly and steadily, plowing his way through boxes of files and reports, updating and digitalizing records to ensure that the history of the fast track land reform program is accurately recorded. As a result of this work, Mike has a wealth of knowledge regarding the names of farmers, their families, as well as their farms and districts. 
included in his work was the development of a database that makes this information and other valuable information readily available when it is needed. Mike is very conscientious and practical in his work, as well as being fiercely loyal to the CFU and its members, and his presence here today is testimony to the fact. Honesty and integrity are hallmarks of his character. Approximately 11 years ago, to fill the void left by the absence of the weekly publication of the Farmer magazine, which the older generation amongst us will remember so well, and just an interesting aside on that, when uh, I first, the first opportunity I had to meet with our former minister, um, the Honourable Perrin Shiri, uh, after becoming president of CFU, um, he remarked on how he had been a member of the CFU in, a, in his early days uh, uh, as a farmer and had always looked forward to receiving the farmer magazine and the wealth of information that he had gained from it was something that he had greatly appreciated. Going back to the fact that the Farmer magazine ceased to exist due to the, one of the, as a, at, the fact that the Farmer magazine ceased to exist was one of the many results of the fast track land reform program and the way it decimated commercial agriculture. Anyway, Mike, stepped in to make sure that communication with members was re-established by reintroducing a weekly online newsletter known as CFU Calling. This publication led to Mike becoming known as the William Shakespeare of the CFU. Every Friday he worked away compiling the information he had gathered from a wide range of sources to produce the next edition. We certainly tried to slow him down and persuade him to maybe not have to issue it every week. But anyway, Mike was determined and continued with that and made sure that the CFU calling became a source of interesting and useful information to many, including ex-farmers around the world who were provided with a way of keeping track of what was happening in their cherished homeland. Over the last couple of years, Mike spent many hours assisting elderly ex-farmers with completing their applications for interim relief. For a number of months, the CFU reception was full of people patiently waiting in line for Mike to assist them. Once this was done, he took call after call and quietly encouraged people to be patient and wait for their interim leave payments. He also made many visits to Ministry of Lands to try and move the process along. At the beginning of 2020, when Ben Purcell Gilpin left CFU, Mike took on the role of acting director. And although this involved very different work, Mike excelled and achieved much, despite the huge impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. His attention to detail, dogged determination and an unwavering commitment to our members was clearly evident in the way he tackled the task of helping all those eligible to obtain offer letters through the government's program of confidence building measures, which was introduced following the sign of the Global Compensation Agreement. He also did more than his part in helping our members whose acquired farms were covered by beepers to obtain the compensation which is due to them, spending hours facilitating and taking part in meetings on their behalf. While Mike was committed to keeping CFU going until such time as a suitable new director was found and appointed, he, like many of our older members, was determined to keep working until he received his compensation so that he would not be a burden to his family. Sadly, this was not to be, and ill health has forced him to forced him to take sick leave and following medical advice he finally made a decision to retire. People like Mike are hard to come by these days and whilst words cannot adequately ex express our gratitude to you Mike for all that you did for CFU and its members we do say thank you and our sincere appreciation to you and pray that this season of life that you're currently in will be kind to you and hopefully you'll receive some compensation we are doing our best to keep on going. The sudden and unexpected absence of Mike from the office, from the CFU offices at the beginning of this year, resulted in our already overstretched staff being stretched even further. And here I have to express my utmost gratitude to Louise for picking up the baton as best she could 
and taking on responsibilities and tasks which most would have run from. Thank you for working closely with me and keeping the wheels turning whilst we continued with our efforts to find a suitable candidate for the post of director. It is obvious that the long-term future of the Commercial Farmers Union depends on our ability to attract new members who are actively farming. And to this end, we felt that we needed to employ a youthful director who would easily relate Stop laughing. <laughs> he would easily relate to the mostly younger generation of farmers on the land. He also needed to be someone who, with the limited resources at our disposal, would be able to develop services and support programs that would be attractive to these farmers who are mostly trying to farm in very uncertain and challenging circumstances. That was what we put in our ad that we circulated when we were looking for candidates for the post. We held many informal meetings and formal interviews over a number of months to try and find the right person for the job. We thought we had found someone. Um, in retrospect, I don't think he would have been able to survive what we're going through now, but he turned down the job. <coughs> so all of our efforts were without success until we received an expression of interest in a CV from Sam. When I read his CV, especially the year of his birth and his high school, I almost wrote him off immediately. <laughs> Fortunately for him, I have a next door neighbor who attended the same school and has the same year of birth. So I was able to do a very, very detailed, in-depth study of his character from way, way back. And um, you know, what I heard was encouraging. We proceeded to have an informal meeting. And from the very first time I met him, I was convinced that he was the right person for the job. And the panel from the CFU Council who conducted his job interview was likewise convinced. While Sam may not have youth on his side, he brings with him a wealth of experience from the IT industry, business and agriculture related industries. He has also had a great deal of experience in dealing with government ministries and officials, something which is so necessary in this position. When, we, when Sam asked what he would be, what would be expected of him, I kind of sort of said, well, I don't think there's going to be much involvement in the compensation process because that's taken care of. Uh, we have a great team and it's, it's going along and I'm sure it'll all unfold. Little did I know what we were headed for. I did say that the core of what I believed he needed to be doing was developing programs and uh, ways that we can attract new farming members. One of the things that Sam also has in his CV is uh, a kind of almost a passion for taking things that are either broken or underperforming and bringing transformation and revival to them. This is exactly what CFU is in need of in a, if it uh, comes down to our long-term survival. So. While Sam may not have youth, sorry, lost my place. Sam joined us in June of this year, and already he has brought transformation and stability to almost every aspect of the CFU and taken a huge weight off my shoulders. He is particularly skilled in dealing with difficult people and difficult relationships. Um, He's managed to get money out of people I never thought we'd get money out of. And uh, I don't want to mention any names, but he, I'm amazed. He's not afraid of confronting when, when confrontation needs to, be <clears throat> needs to be the route, but he does it in a way that no one ends up being offended. 
he has also begun to build relationships at senior levels in the Ministry of Lands and Agriculture and other government ministries, as well as with the diplomatic community. So Mike, your concerns about what's going to happen with offer letters and 99-year leases, I think you can rest assured that Sam is well on the way to uh, working with the, the personalities that are there and uh, that work will continue, as well as dealing with the, the myriad of other things that we failed to resolve while, while you and I were trying as hard as we could. I wholeheartedly believe in the power of prayer. And Sam, you are definitely an answer to my prayers. Thank you for agreeing to join us. Your arrival at CFU is definitely one of the highs. I look forward to working with you, hopefully to see compensation in some form becoming a reality in a way that is going to be beneficial to us and not put us into a trap that we want to, that we're doing our absolute uh, best to stay out of. But more than that, I look forward to working with you as we in the CFU endeavor to transform this organization into the farmers' union of choice for farmers who are actively farming. To that end, we have, or uh, work has already begun. Uh, Sam, with his experience and background in IT, is well placed to, to be able to help us become uh, tech savvy and uh, these youngsters that like to do everything on their phones and uh, with the app and all that stuff, which is a bit over the heads of some of us who are older. Sam, we're looking forward to seeing what can come out of that. We are also, as a union, looking at um, rekindling the relationship that we had with ZFU back in the days of ZFAT. They have approached us, even in Mike's, when Mike was there, they approached us and said, come on, you guys. There's, there's opportunity for synergies here that we can take, that we can work, uh, use, take, use to our advantage. And I'm looking forward to those as we move forward together. Moving on, I would like to express my appreciation to our line minister, the Honorable Dr. Masuka, for his ongoing policy of, inter of interaction with farmers unions and the regular meetings that he holds with us. Since he, has, since he was appointed, he has gone out of his way to seek our input on the many and varied challenges that we all face. This continues to be refreshing and encouraging after so many years of being shunned under the previous dispensation. I would also like to thank our Honourable Minister for continuing to support and facilitate the implementation of the confidence building measures that were introduced in uh, 2020, namely the issuing of offer letters and 99-year leases to the former farm owners who are still on a fa farming on all or a portion of their original farms. To date, 126 of our farmers have received offer letters through this, um, through this um, initiative, and many 99-year leases are currently being processed. There are outstanding applications which, um, uh, and other issues which Sam and myself are looking at and working with the new director and Ministry of Lands to try and address so that these can be put behind us and dealt with once and for all. On the topic of the 99-year leases, we are looking forward to the release of the new 99-year lease, which we have been assured is bankable, transferable and tradable. I would now like to move on to the compensation process. Without doubt, one of the lows for us has been the failure by government to honour the payment terms of the global compensation deed. After we acceded to the, re the request from government last year to postpone by 12 months the date for the initial payment to 29th of July 2022, much time and energy has been expended by us in the past year trying to mobilize resources to enable government to fulfill its obligations under the deed, but all to no avail. The latest payment offer which we 
have received is a far cry from what was originally agreed. It may, however, with sufficient amendments and legal safeguards and exit clauses put in place, still be something that we can make to work for us. Only time will tell. Here I would like to pay particular tribute to Charlie Tafts, the chairman of our Compensation Steering Committee, who has often, in extremely frustrating circumstances, put so much of his passion, energy and time into seeing compensation become a reality. I have no doubt that the heart attack which he recently suffered was at least in part the result of the stress, frustration and disappointment of seeing so little for all of our efforts. Charlie, we thank you for all your efforts on behalf of so many and we pray for your full and speedy recovery. I would also like to thank Harry Orfanides for all the time and energy that he has put into the compensation process. Harry, your dogged determination to keep going long after others have, would have quit is an inspiration to the rest of us. I have to include in this list Nick Swanapool, Alan York, Patrick Ashton, John Reed Rowland, John Laurie, all CSC members. I hope I haven't left anybody out, have I? <laughs> All of these CSC members, as, as well as our own CFU council, serve as volunteers, attending meetings at their own expense, with no financial reward, not even expenses paid. All are making huge sacrifices on behalf of others. These sacrifices are not only costly to them, but also to their wives and their families and their businesses. And I would like to just pay tribute to each one of you who serves in a capacity for giving of your time and your energy, for sacrificing time with your families, for sacrificing business opportunities. And um, we all know what happens to businesses, our businesses, when we're not on site and unable to give it the time we need, that, that it needs. Thank you to all of you. We're also very grateful to our American partners, R and Fox, who have continued to work tirelessly to find a way for us to be paid for our compensation in an acceptable form and manner. Their expertise, vast experience, and the relationships in the, that they have in the US and other parts of the world have made resources available to this process, which we would never have found or been able to afford on our own. It is rare to find people like them who will continue to assist us even when it seems like the chances of success are so small. At the recent meetings which were held around the country and on the online platform, by far the majority of those who attended expressed support for our strategy going forward. On the back of this support, and I know Harry spoke a little bit earlier, Oren Fox have already done considerable work and prepared a, a draft of the amendments which will need to be made to the global compensation deed and the government's payment offer in order for it to be something that will be acceptable to us. We will continue along the road of this process until we are satisfied that we have got the best possible arrangement for us with the least possible risk. As was clearly stated in the meetings, we will not sign anything on behalf of any individual and no individual will be asked to sign anything until they have had the opportunity to thoroughly examine what is on the table and obtain an opinion from their own legal representatives. And um, as we mentioned earlier in the closed session, we are working t together with the, our, the CFU legal representative to try and put a team of local uh, legal practitioners together to be able to examine and give a thorough legal opinion on whatever comes out of our ongoing interactions with government. I would here like to say thank you to the many who came up to us at the meetings or sent messages on WhatsApp or email to thank us for the work that we are doing on their behalf. In the face of much criticism that has uh, been flying around, it's these people.
people who've been so sincere and so appreciative of all that we've done that encourage us to keep on going and uh, do whatever we can to try and bring closure, bring, some, uh, bring compensation that will uh, enable us to move forward. The theme of this year's Congress is tilling yesterday's field for tomorrow's harvest. To me, this points to the fact that without dealing with the past, we cannot move into the future. For this reason, it is absolutely imperative that the compensation becomes a reality. And we at the CFU and the CSC will continue to do all that we can to make this happen. In closing, I would like to thank our small and dedicated CFU staff team for all the work that you do for our members. I would also like to thank you for the way you are working with Sam and uh, the changes that he's brought, around, brought about. I hope that it resolves some of the issues that went for so long being unresolved and um, enables us to move forward into what the future holds as a team that are united and uh, are able to work together. Thank you also, I have mentioned the CFU Council, but thank you to each one of you for, the support, for your support over the last year. Thank you for your willingness to drop uh, things and attend meetings at short notice, for your involvement in the process of finding Sam and getting him on board, and uh, all the other things that you've done. Um, I'm very grateful to serve with such a team of incredible men who give so freely. I would like to thank my managers in my farming operations who continue to do such a sterling job making sure that I'll have a business to go back to when I finally finish my time here as the CFU president. At this stage, not quite sure when that will be, uh, since we can't even persuade anyone to take up the post of vice president. But Sam, part of your brief is to make sure that we get some new, younger, enthusiastic farmers involved in CFU and help them understand the incredible value of this organization, the power that comes from being united, standing together and uh, having uh, someone who can represent us on the bigger stage so we don't have to fight our battles in, as individuals. Um, and I'm looking forward to next year's Congress and uh, seeing us maybe back at Art Farm with a full auditorium of farmers who are working the land, hopefully in a very different situation uh, to what we currently are having to deal with when it comes to tenure and uh, security on the land and uh, the long-term uh, investment that's needed to, to make farming a viable enterprise. And hopefully next year we'll have someone who's prepared to at least be vice president <laughs> so that I can see the end uh, in sight. To my wonderful wife, Louise, and our five precious and amazing children, thank you for supporting and encouraging me to keep on going on this journey. And thank you too for the way you join me on this journey as well. And last but not least, thank you to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for your overwhelming goodness to me. I count myself truly blessed to be serving in Zimbabwe, to be serving you, to be serving our farmers, to be serving our nation. Because I believe that what we are doing here is not just for a few farmers on the land or even a few farmers who are waiting for compensation. And I know there's 2,000 whatever of us waiting compensation, but in the overall scheme of things, that's a very small number when you look at the size of our nation. I believe what we are working towards will bring, it's the key to the future of Zimbabwe and the prosperity of our nation. So I count it a privilege to be part of this process. And I'm looking forward to seeing God, the miracle working God, work miracles that hopefully will astound us in the not too distant future. And maybe astound the world that's watching us. 
I pray that the 2022-23 farming season will bring the abundant rains, full dams and bountiful harvests that we all so badly need. May God bless you all. Thank you very much. Sorry, we have, um, I've just been advised that we have Professor Robert Giri, the head of Agritex, am I right? The head of Agritex who has been asked by our Honourable Minister, Dr. Masuka, to come and be a part of our proceedings. And Professor Giri, I believe you've got an address that you would like to give. Can I ask you just to wait one minute? Um, we would like to just give um, opportunity for anybody who would like to make some comments or um, feedback on my report, and then I will ask you to come and address us, sir. Thank you. So, sorry, does anybody have any questions to Andy's report? Comments, not a question. Um, if it's something that you would like to be heard, please talk into the mic so that those that are watching via the YouTube. Yeah, good. Um, yeah, it's, it's just a comment. Um, Andy, I'd like please, to... Please, can you tell us who you are, Dion? Just in um, case there's people watching who don't know. Uh, my name's Dion Teron, uh, ex-farmer. Past president, please. <laughs> Past president. Uh, no worries. Um, Andy, I'd, I'd, I'd like to thank you and encourage you. Uh, the CFU is, is, a, is an old... I was going to say organization, union, and it's very powerful. When, when CFU need to speak to, to ministers or the IMF, the doors open. And as farmers, we tend to sometimes forget that. Um, as president, I know that uh, a lot of criticism will come your way. That's part of the package. Very often, the people that are very negative are the most vocal sometimes with good reason. But I'd like to encourage you and I'd like to thank you. It's, it is a thankless task. And to the rest of your, your council as well, thanks guys. It's, it's vital that CFU continue. I know the compensation issue is a big issue, but without you, you a CFU's involvement, there's actually nothing on the table. So we'll better it. It's, it's, it's like an old, old, old car that needs to be panel beaten and then resprayed. But, yeah, from my side, it, as I said, it's just a comment, really, to thank you and encourage you. You're going to take flack. That's part of the package. But from my side, and I think a lot of people, thanks very much for what you guys are doing. Thank you. Thank you, Dion. Anybody else like to make any comments, say anything? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Professor Jiri, can I ask you to come up? to the microphone and give us your address. We are currently, the proceedings are currently being viewed online on, the YouTube, on, a, on a YouTube link. So we're not sure how many people are watching, but I'm sure there's many who will appreciate what you have to say to us. Thank you for coming and we look forward to hearing from you, sir. Thank you, um, and uh, yes, you asked the fact to stand. I, I spent 20 years standing in the classroom, so I don't have problems standing. Um, I will, I don't normally put on a tie, but I was uh, sent to another meeting which needed a tie. I couldn't go back to the office to untie. So please, I see that none of you has a tie, obviously. I would have joined you, but uh, uh, duty calls. I have a speech that has been prepared uh, for the minister, who unfortunately there is cabinet today, agent cabinet, so they couldn't hold it on uh, Tuesday because the president was not available, so it's today. 
That's why he sent me. So I will read this speech. Please spare me from questions that require the Honorable Minister. Uh, uh, I think he would have been the best to answer those questions, but uh, I, I, I can answer some uh, to the best of my ability. I also have to just say that uh, uh, I am also a product of uh, the CFU. I think some of you would remember Court Red, uh, the Cotton, which later became a private company with uh, Michelle Bragg, Duncan Kennard, and so forth. Those uh, I worked with uh, in a brief stint in my life. So I'm not very, very new. Uh, obviously, the Farmer Rama people and high field harvesters I, from the chemical side of things. I also was involved. Uh, I am very proud that I eventually killed uh, high field harvesters. I was the man. <laughs> so uh, to uh, let me recognize the president uh, of the CFU, uh, Mr. Pasco, the chief executive officer, uh, Mr. S. Miller. Uh, I also want to recognize the Congress delegates, CFU management and staff, and all the distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Um, I will read the minister's speech now. I'm privileged to participate at this uh, CFU 79th Annual Congress where you are celebrating 79 years of existence. I have heard that you had, a rich, you had rich discussions yesterday. It is an undisputed fact that organized farming in Zimbabwe contributes to achieving national goals as set out in the agriculture and food systems transformation strategy and indeed the national development strategy one indeed without organized farmers unions it is difficult to celebrate agricultural transformation and growth the president of the republic of zimbabwe his excellency uh, dr edim nangagwa recently launched the agriculture and food systems transformation strategy in august 2020 so the theme of this annual congress dubbed tilling yesterday's field for tomorrow's harvest is both timely and relevant ladies and gentlemen the anger plans for the agriculture and food systems transformation strategy comprise number one the agricultural recovery plan number two the livestock recovery and growth plan Number three, the Accelerated Irrigation Rehabilitation and Development Plan. Number four, the Horticultural Recovery and Growth Plan. And number five, the Integrated Agriculture Information Management System. And more recently, a Tobacco Transformation Plan was launched and the Fisheries and Aquaculture Development Plan is being finalized. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, our agricultural transformation efforts are now beginning to show results. This year's uh, winter wheat season has shown us that working together collectively and collaboratively can achieve food self-sufficiency. An unprecedented 80,000 hectares have been put under wheat with an expected harvest of over 384 metric tons, the highest the, in the history of the country. We did this on, we must build on this momentum into the summer season to assure our nation of perennial food security away from the weather determined food security escapades of the past. This is possible with the presidential climate-proofed uh, input scheme uh, from VUZA or INTKWASA now better fine-tuned so that it is grown or reared 
in an agroecological region, uh, uh, as, we, as we have said. Through the establishment of 35,000 farmer field schools across 35,000 villages, we are laying a firm foundation for resilient, robust, and sustainable agricultural growth. In the process, some 3 million rural households and 500,000 peri urban uh, uh, or peri rural, as we now call them, families are now benefiting countrywide. In the large scale sector, irrigation, rehabilitation, and development is taking place at an accelerated pace and scale. In the livestock sector, through the presidential blitz degree scheme, we have reduced disease induced cattle deaths by 50%, paving the way for national head rebuilding. The dairy sector is rebounding with a 17% year and on year growth. Regarding smaller stock, the presidential rural poultry scheme and the presidential goat scheme, both recently launched, will spare growth in this subsector. In the 2021 season, the Fumvuza program contributed an increase uh, of 41% in national production. That's the 2020-2021 season. That productivity levels, that saw productivity levels increase from about 0 0.5 metric tons per hectare to about 1.3 metric tons per hectare. This must be improved and sustained. We are accelerating the capacitation for extension staff, now called Agritex business advisors, using the twin approach of physical and mental capacitation. Additionally, we launched the new curriculum conveniently called Agricultural Education for Development 5.0, focusing on training, extension, innovation, business development, and research away from the Agricultural Education 2.0, which focused on producing extensionists and trainers only, and not entrepreneurs from our agricultural colleges. Our agricultural colleges will also have college advisor boards to assist in agro-region specific development of the colleges. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, there are other ministry interventions that are aimed at creating an enabling environment for accelerated agricultural transformation and growth. Among them, irrigation development, including under the Irrigation Development Alliance, a stakeholder approach to accelerate the establishment of 350,000 hectares of irrigation by the year 2025 from the current 185,000 hectares. Regarding mechanization, government and its stakeholders envis envisage availing 9,000 tractors under various schemes with government contribution of uh, 4,500 tractors and over 200 combine harvesters. The localization of projects has been extended to equipment manufacture, dam construction, and localization of fertilizer and chemicals production. In all these endeavors, government will be an active player and an active facilitator. Regarding financing, there are various options for farmers in the 2022-2023 season, from self-financing contract guaranteed schemes such as AFC and CBZ under the National Enhanced Productivity Scheme uh, and value chain financing. In terms of markets, Government will continue to purchase grains to build up the strategic grain reserve to the revised 1.5 million metric tons, which comprise 300,000 metric tons of traditional grains and 1.2 million metric tons of maize. And we'll begin to build some wheat strategic grain reserve. The Zimbabwe 
uh, mission, mission rail exchange will be supported, that's the ZMEX, initially for non-strategic crops. The warehouse system now operational and should, is now operational and be, should be used by contractors. With these policies and strategies in place, agriculture will be a major contributor to the attainment of Vision 2030. To complement the Ministry's thrust of transforming agriculture, all the parastatals under the Ministry have been reformed and restructured and transformed and rebranded. Furthermore, to allow room for effective engagement with various stakeholders, 16 working groups, and I'm sure some of you attend some of them, have been formed and these are regular platforms for various stakeholders to interface with the ministry as we transform agriculture. Regarding legislative changes, government is seized with the review of various land-related acts and the 99-year lease and those related to the marketing of grain, including SI 145 of 2019. Land is an economic enabler, so I urge all A1 and A2 farmers to use this productively and to complete the annual production and productivity return forms. The annual production and productivity return forms are now the basis of issuance of 99-year leases. On a related note, the signing of the global compensation deed heralded a new era in our land reform program. Government has now given the majority of former farm owners re requisite tenure documents. A total of 216A2 permits were issued to former farm owners against 308 applications. The remaining 47 applications for A2 permits are still being processed. Government has requested the Commercial Farmers Union to avail their list of outstanding permits for reconciliation. In terms of 99-year leases, a total of 175 farm owners applied for 99-year leases. Government has issued 37 99-year leases, and of these, 10 have been registered with the civil division, and 27 are at various stages of registration. A total of 139 99-year lease applications from former farm owners are still under consideration. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let us take farming as a business and make land productive for the attainment of Vision 2030. It is common knowledge that land is a, is a finite resource against a background of geometric growth in population. This is posing serious pressure on land demand. It must therefore be noted that all A1 and A2 farmers are privileged to have been given an opportunity to lease land. Because of the limited availability of land, not everyone with a passion for farming will be allocated land. However, one does not need to own land in order to undertake farming or engage in a profitable agricultural business. The government approved a joint venture agreement framework which allows investors to undertake farming operations with the consent of government. It must be emphasized that all joint ventures must be approved by the ministry for them to be legally binding documents. Section 18 of the Land Commission Act of uh, Chapter 20, uh, sub, uh, Section 29, buttresses this position by asserting that no occupier of state land shall permit occupation on a sharecropping basis by another person unless a formal agreement has been entered to between the owner and the occupier with that agreement having been approved by the minister. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the joint ventures which government is encouraging 
are aimed at increasing production and productivity on farms and at the same time easing pressure on the demand for land by potential farmers. With the government thrust of increasing agricultural production and productivity, abandoned, derelict and underutilized farms shall be liable for risk possession and redistribution to deserving beneficiaries on the waiting list for land allocation. Those allocated land but with limited capacity to fully utilize the respective pieces of land should seek joint venture partners. Those willing to invest should, to, should write to the ministry indicating areas of interest for matchmaking purposes. Sub submission of production and productivity return forms comes handy under these circumstances as they assist the ministry in knowing farmers who might want assistance through joint ventures. Farmers who submit false information risk losing tenure documents. Let me highlight the strong agricultural development, rural industrialization, rural development vision 2030 Nexus, anchored on the uh, correct observations that development originating from the agricultural sector is twice as powerful at lifting people out of poverty than development emanating from other sectors, and that no country has transitioned from a low-income economy to a middle uh, or upper-middle upper income economy without increasing agricultural productivity. We know that agricultural development will cause rural industrialization. We also know that rural industrialization will spur rural uh, de uh, development. And we are also cognizant of the fact that rural development will accelerate and facilitate the attainment of Vision 2030. Agricultural interventions for the upliftment of rural livelihoods for the attainment of Vision 2030 have now been packaged under the collective name of Rural Development 8.0. Rural Development 8.0 comprise a series of outcome and impact-based presidential schemes such as the Fumvudza program, uh, which, which we call the Presidential Climate Proofed Income Input Scheme, uh, the cotton uh, scheme, the presidential blitz degree scheme, the presidential rural development program, the presidential community fisheries scheme, the presidential poultry scheme, the presidential goat scheme, and the vision 2030 accelerator model. These outcome-based interventions directly impact the attainment of vision 2030 as causes co-factors, accelerators, and multipliers. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, as often eloquently pronounced by the President, His Excellency Dr. Edim Nangagwa, let us rebuild our country, brick by brick, stone upon stone, nukuti Equally, let us rebuild our agriculture, household by household, plot by plot, farm by farm. Nuguti uh, wakwa Let me now take this opportunity to wish the CFU success at this annual uh, Congress and all, in all its future endeavors. For us to be able to continue with this discussion, feel free to interface with the minister uh, at uh, his email address, I'll leave that with you. And uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen and all guests, it is now my singular honor to declare, that is the minister, not me, to declare the Commercial Union, uh, the Commercial Farmers Union 79th Congress officially opened. Thank you, the tender, Siabonga. I will leave this with you. Thank you.
questions. I, I believe that there are no questions to me, mm -hmm. uh, except those directed to the minister, but I will take them to okay. the minister. Thank you. P Professor Jiri, thank you so very much for attending and for uh, addressing us on behalf of the minister. Um, I'm sh I'm, uh, I'd like to ask if there are any questions that uh, people would like to put to Professor Jiri, um, and if he is uh, willing and able to answer, maybe he can help us with the answers. Yes, Dion. Um, thank you, Andy. Um, maybe just a comment again and not a question. I have to say, I have to, I have to be honest, I was not impressed at, at all with uh, what I heard. The problem with government is instead of governing, they want to rule. If, if the minister op wants the farmers to be successful, release the leash, respect title. Farmers are capable. Um, they're being held back. And that's, that's just a comment from my side. Um, the, the farmers are out there, they're very capable, they're very willing, but they're feeling restricted. By saying you don't need to own land to be productive, it's the same as saying you don't need to own a car to drive around. You can hire one. Give the farmers a bit more freedom, respect the title, and this country will turn around. The farmers can do it. Thank you, Dion. Anyone else like to ask a question or make a comment? Uh, Professor Jiri, it looks like you've got off light. No, thank you. I think that was a good comment. I will yeah, I think, pass it on. I think the reality of what, uh, what we need is, uh, the, the, and hopefully the new 99-year lease, which was alluded to, is going to bring what we need in this for farming to flourish. Yeah. That ability to use your land as collateral, to be able to do the development, the security of tenure. Um, um, obviously, we've got to be able to have a, in place a mechanism where those that are not using the land productively are removed or that land is, been, is able to be put into the hands of those who can use it productively. But at the same time, there does need to be a secure, tradable, bankable tenure system in place that enables us to develop in uh, with great confidence um, going forward. And um, I'm sure you're aware that a lot of the investment that needs to be made in agriculture is, is long term. And without that security that there's a long-term plan in place, long-term security of tenure in place, it becomes very difficult. That is one of the challenges with the, with the JV agreements that many of us are involved in. Uh, even with the, the legal safeguards, there, there's, that, there's always that risk that uh, things fall apart or the, the landholder suddenly decides he's got a better offer and things have changed. So if there's ways that that can be dealt with and addressed, it would certainly um, create a more conducive environment for, for, for agriculture to be, especially commercial agriculture that does require long-term investment to flourish. So maybe if we can take that message back to, to the Honourable Minister. The other uh, aspect, um, Professor Jiri, that we would like to just highlight is the controls that are in place. We fully understand that there's the need, there is the need for strategic grain reserves and that situation the current restrictions on, uh, that are in place through SI145 that make it almost impossible for us to move grain uh, and the current um, permit system really do make it extremely difficult. Farmers now, we spend our time trying to deal with bureaucracy mm. rather than get on with the business of farming. The GMB and the government ent entities ideally should become the buyer of last resort, set the price, and if the market is not going to buy it, uh, for whatever reason, it goes to the GMB. But to have the situation where you, before you can sell to anybody, you've now got to jump through a whole lot of hurdles and make sure you've got a contract in place uh, before you plant. Otherwise, you're bound to sell to the GMB, who in many situations are offering a price that's way below the market price makes it extremely difficult for, for us who produce, uh, who, um, especially things like maize. Mm. And um, we are eagerly awaiting the announcement of the wheat price. Hopefully we'll hear that today. I'm sure you're aware that, that harvesting is, in, is un well underway in many areas. And the, the delay has, is, um, 
is a serious concern. But if you can convey to the minister, we as certainly our members are more than willing to play our part in bringing food security to the nation, but um, it helps if government plays its part in creating an enabling environment rather than making it more difficult for us to, to operate and deal, putting a whole raft of bureaucratic uh, hurdles in our way. Uh, it really saps our energy and our time and then we find that uh, the farming, the actual production processes are, are not done as, as well as they could be. Mm -hmm. So that would be my comment and the message I would like to convey to our minister. I, I didn't see when you arrived but I hope you heard no. my comments and my address. We are very grateful to our minister um, for his interaction with us, for the open door he certainly has had for, for me. I'm grateful. Please can you convey that to him. Thank you, sir. No, I will. And I think maybe I'll answer what, uh, I'll take the message to the minister, but I think I'll answer some of the things that I'm involved in. Uh, and yes, thank you for the intervention in terms of wheat. I was at uh, Ad, uh, uh, Antelope where they are harvesting wheat and I can tell you that the yields are very, very high. I think the average for the 90 hectares that they've, they had harvested by Friday last week, they were 7.5 tons per hectare. And that is quite incredible. Uh, the wheat price, yes, will be announced. Uh, I think it, the paper is with cabinet today and I do know the price. I'm not allowed to say it. So. <laughs> But we have tried to, to come up with a, a good pricing model to, to make sure that uh, farmers are happy. I can just hint that it's a very good price, uh, which, which I think is in the format you may be happy with. Uh, in terms of uh, the, the maize story and SI-145, yes, we really take uh, the problems there. We have, uh, we have uh, uh, been attending to them. I think recently we then allowed uh, even the, the one grown under command, under CBZ and AFC, we allowed them to, to, to be able to purchase the grain themselves. Because we understood that if they are to be able to repay under command, they, they should be able to have the money, and that money is not with the GMB. It's with people who uh, buy and pay properly in a, uh, with the true value. So uh, that uh, uh, command has taken that shift where now those who finance it, AFC and CBZ, have now been allowed to, to, to purchase with their off-takers and not, uh, not necessarily through GMB. Obviously, there are mechanisms, particularly for maize, to make sure that we build on our SGR, which was the major concern to say, so how do we build the SGR? But I can assure you that with the new breed of uh, officers in the ministry, we are pushing quite a lot to make sure that agriculture uh, remains viable and most of these issues are are addressed. I think those who have uh, interacted with uh, myself in those uh, seven o'clock meetings, you have seen that it's, it's a very big paradigm shift and we are advising the minister on the correct things that should be done. Yes, the other bit that we can deal with, we, we may not be able to deal with, but as long as it's technical and production related, we do advise the minister and I can tell you that uh, we actually have a listening minister this time around who is also technically sound. So he does listen and some of the concerns that are technical in nature, uh, we, 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 we take them and advise correctly. Those that are of not, not so technical in nature, I also take them to the minister to make a ruling. Otherwise, thank you very much and thank you everyone. Thank you, Professor Jiri, and uh, thank you for attending with your suit, your jacket and tie. I actually have mine behind me, but I saw none, no one else was wearing, so I left them. <laughs> Thank you.
next thing on our agenda is our, our guest speaker, one of our own, Alan York. And Professor Jiri, I would, if you're able, I would ask, if possible, for you to stay and hear Mr. York's address. I think you'll find it very interesting. Thank you, Alan. Please, will you come to the mic? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, friends far and wide. If Byron's falling asleep, he can take assurance that I'm going to be no less than two hours. <laughs> I wasn't sure whether this was going to be a punishment or a privilege when Sam asked if I would give a presentation on what's happening in Zimbabwe, the way. I'm engaged, and a few lessons that we perhaps can draw from it. I by no means consider myself exceptional to the norm. I'm just part of one of the band of previous commercial farmers trying to make a plan and trying to live within the existing scenario. You might excuse us if we sometimes feel that you're punished by having your land taken away that you purchased for an act that happened before you were born by people that when they performed that act it was perfectly legal. Yet we are bearing the brunt of it in this whole land adjustment. Through you, Professor, to our line minister, we are part of Team Zimbabwe. We are here working with you, not against you. We are working with you to try and find solutions. The theme of what I want to talk about is very simply yesterday, today, and tomorrow. A lot of the frustrations and the difficulties that we face today have their roots in yesterday. It's, it's very important to pay attention to history not for revenge, not for unproductive reasons, but to learn the lessons of history so that we can hopefully avoid repeating those mistakes that previous people have made in our country. Let me touch a little bit on yesterday. When we go back to pre-colonial days, pre-1890, and there's some people in this room whose ancestry goes back that far, when the ancestors came up here as hunters and explorers, and then they participated in this colonization. It came at an expense. And a lot of that expense was borne by all people of Zimbabwe, not least of all our black Zimbabweans, the, the Shonas, the Ndebeles. They made huge sacrifices in those times against their will, necessitating the white colonials of the early days to engage in a war against the Matabeles because it was deemed that Lobangula was king of the land. And it started a system of attrition, of violence, that has been perpetuated through time. 
tragically. Let's not drag ourselves through all of that. But let's just simply make the point that in what we were told was the Rudd concession, which was actually the Lobangula concession, he specifically precluded land from what he availed to these white prospectors. You can go and scratch for rocks and gold, not the land. We took the land by the Matabili War, by conquest. And then in those early 18, 1910, 1920, when those early white settlers were here, wanting to know what their future was. It was adjudged by the British Privy Council that indeed the King of England owned this land. And should we, the new settler regime here, want it, we needed to pay the King of England $2.3 billion, 2.3 million pounds, I beg your pardon which we duly did. And that started a system whereby we believed we were legitimate. In our eyes, we were. In the black man's eyes, mm, something rubbed. Something didn't ring true. Many of us here are the progeny of successive generation of farmers who've got on with it, Regardless of question marks lingering at the back. We even got on at it after the war in 1980. I happened to be chairman of the Zimbabwe, so the Zimbabwe Society of Natal University. So we summonsed and we received a representation from the Zimbabwean government to come and address the students because our question was do you want us or do you not must we tell these 2000 odd zimbabwean students in natal university in the in the early days of zimbabwe that they were no longer needed and they could move on and a clear message back from our president then the prime minister robert mugabe to say you're not paying attention it's the national reconciliation. We are melting our guns and turning them into plowshares. And we need every single bit of capital knowledge that we've got to come back and help us rebuild Zimbabwe. And we did that with gusto. Seventy percent of our land has been bought since the independence of Zimbabwe, changed hands. Some of it has been bought actually from the Zimbabwean government itself. So, Professor, you would, you would understand that there is a degree of confusion in our midst. Yet we still continue to be faithful, honorable, working Zimbabweans trying to be productive, trying to go forward, trying to advise on simple things that make absolute economic sense, but they get confused by politics, like land ownership. I hear the minister's statement that you don't need to own land to make it productive. Respectfully, sir, I disagree. You will not nurture rented land like you will owned land. Drive through town and you can see an owned house from a rented house. Drive through, fly over the countryside and you'll see the communal areas largely degraded. Go over the land which is owned, whether it be small scale or large scale commercial. It's generally in reasonable condition, was in very good condition. 
the thin ribbon of water that divides Murumbedzi from Trelawney Darwindale, the identical climate, the identical soils, and on the western side is Zvimba, where even the cattle are thin, and there's poverty there. And on the eastern side, some of the most productive, profoundly wealthy, preserved pieces of nature and farms. And the one big difference is ownership. I'm always impressed, as I am again today, with all the magnificent statistics that pour out from what government are doing and all their projects and plans. Their prognosis of productivity. Respectfully, sir, we've just had two very good rainy seasons, well above normal. And in the last few months, we've been importing maize from Malawi. And the last thing that I read in our Good Herald newspaper is that we've importing another 200,000 tons of maize from Zambia. Surely the facts speak for themselves. Something is not right. Something is amiss. My object today is not to read the riot act and doom and gloom to us here. It's actually to find something positive from this. Something to look forward to. Something to be part of what I deem Team Zimbabwe. Team Zimbabwe starts with you, Mr. Pasco, as the president of the CFU, until we get to the stage where the CFU is not perceived as the enemy, as we are perceived as part of Team Zimbabwe. And that is our biggest challenge. We can ask Sam to try and find the youngsters who want to join us and do all that. They're afeard. That's the honest truth. Because if you're part of the, part of the CFU, oh, Government treats you with the hands off. So it's not only bringing the youngsters on board. It's simultaneously bridging the chasm between ourselves and the government. And we are here extending the bridge from our side, sir. We await for your side to try and join us. I have a few simple sayings. I observe opportunities. Things are in constant flux. One needs to continually assess, adapt. Then you survive and get it right and then you thrive. We haven't been dealt the best hand of cards in this current round. There's no doubt about it. There's no kings and aces in this hand. It's a monkey's hand. Twos and threes and fours. But what I have found is that if you play that hand to the best of your ability, you'll be pleasantly surprised. It's a fact that we cannot deny. The price of product, never mind the politics, it's determined by the laws of supply and demand. And when the supply is hugely short relative to the demand, the difference between those two is profit. It needs to be made up. 
I believe we are getting better prices today by government's well-intentioned activities. I'm not being critical. You're trying to keep people viable. But many of the people that you're trying to keep viable are actually not farmers, sir. They've been rewarded their land for political patronage, not for farming expertise, not because they're a product of Guibi or Chibero, and many of our black Zimbabweans are suffering. You've got the skilled players, but you leave them on the sidelines. Bring us back to the opportunity right now. That guy, Dennis Norman, he used to work out our prices by saying, well, it costs 100 bucks a ton to produce maize, so we'll give the farmers 120, so there's a little margin in there. If you were a good farmer, you got a good tonnage, and you made a good price. You made a good return. But if you're a bum farmer, you fell by the wayside. Today, we've got pricing in place that keeps everybody on the land. Even people that don't produce anything are still on the land. But it does mean for those of us that are able to participate and farm, it's actually quite lucrative. In fact, lucrative enough to pay sometimes 7 10% of your gross turnover as rental to the farms. Our old rule of thumb in the commercial world was that a farm was worth its annual turnover. And it normally took us, if we borrowed our money from the AFC, 20, 25 years of our profit to repay that land. And that wasn't an expense. That was an investment into your, into your balance sheet into your asset portfolio. Now, renting our land from people who didn't have to pay money for it, we're having to repay equal to the value of that land every 10 years. And yet, sir, we've waited 22 years for even sight of compensation. You understand the confusion? If you were to buy a house in town, it would normally take you 25 years of rental to pay it off. But go and get a farm, and you can earn the entire value of that in 10 years. It's a good business. I work on farms, and I'm blessed to have my entire family with me. All of my kids and Lorna, they all participate with me in our endeavor to stay alive. We've got to pay respect to the previous owners of that land. A lot of them are destitute. And they need that recognition and they need some contribution towards them. So besides for paying rent to the new landowner, we've also got to give consideration to the destituted previous landowner. There's many people that I rent from that are A2 farmers, A1, and I respect them hugely if they've got dirt under their fingernails, if they're workers on the land. I endeavor to share knowledge with these people. Make it a genuine joint venture. Share machinery. Share expertise and give them upliftment where it can. There's a wonderful feeling of achievement when you've got success around you, as opposed to the destitution that is on a lot of the land that's in our commercial sector today. I hold field days and I help them with marketing endeavors. And the response is wonderful. It's good. Our people of Zimbabwe are not bad people. They're wonderful people. They really are. You only have to have lived 
perhaps like I and some others that grew up as pickinins in the farm village and occasionally got your ear cuffed by the matriarch of that village when you were rude or did something stupid, to understand that you're part of the farming village. Not because you're white or black, you're just a pickinin. Now, that's not how you behave. So I've grown up with him. I grew up speaking Sindhibele. Perhaps it also helped that I did seven years eating sadza and beans with the likes of Lookout Masuku and Dumusu Dabengwa in Chikarubi, that I learned to appreciate the other side of it, their frustrations and their endeavors. I have no problem working with our indigenous black people. It's a privilege that I'd rather be here than anywhere else in the world. A lot of the problems that we're facing are just the growing pains of democracy. Not even America or England herself have got this whole thing of democracy exactly right. And here we expect our fledgling baby democracy to just get it right like that. Well, these are growing pains we've got to go through. And if we prepare to go through, there will be a prize on the other side. I'd like to conclude with a few Simple observations. We've got to stop the cycle of violence. This business of keeping control through the barrel of the gun as opposed to the, the honest democracy. In a real democracy, there's no losers. We've simply, Team Zimbabwe, we've chosen the most competent person to carry the responsibility of leading the nation for the next five years. We tragically treat it as a civil war with as much bloodshed as a civil war in order to retain the power. That, that's not productive. We've got to stop that cycle of violence. Our Zimbabwean population are educated and sensible people. We've got some of the most highly educated on the continent. And something that I see throughout is a genuine respect. They respect elders, white or black. And they show respect to each other. Normally, some of the youngsters that have got too many of the Western world's ideals of perhaps booze and drugs are less respectful. But in the old tradition, we have a nation that's wonderfully endowed with the nature, the environment, the climate, the minerals, and the land. We have farmers who are competent and competitive. If we allow the true farmers to have a participation in the agricultural business, instead of being sidelined. We have many challenges here for the future. And I believe compensation to be the foundation of many things going forward that can be productive. Without compensation, this country is in the doldrums. Sanctions, sir, are not because of the land acquisition, as is commonly practiced, commonly espoused. It's how it took place. When our war veterans took the law into their own hands, when the referendum of 1999, where Mr. Mugabe Ask the population, do I take the land without compensation? And that referendum came back with a clear no. Let's do it within the law. And our war veterans, with their best intentions, subverted that. That is the baseline 
of why sanctions is there. Because we've broken our own laws. Not because you've taken the land. It's how we've taken the land. I look forward to a future. I'd rather be here than anywhere else. But perhaps I'm blessed because I've got my family still with me. And for that I'm eternally grateful. I look forward to tomorrow and I suggest we all take a positive attitude and give it our best shot. Thank you very much. Alan, <clears throat> thank you, Alan, for those um, for that uh, address and for some of those uh, facts that some of us probably didn't know or had probably heard different versions of <laughs> through our education. Thank you, and yeah, I I hear you. I think there is hope for the future for us as we maybe need a little bit of patience as our fledgling democracy grows and matures. One thing I do just need to correct you on, and maybe I have a different perception. I think under the old dispensation, CFU was publicly declared the enemy of the state. I, th I believe that all changed in 2017, and His Excellency President Munangagwa welcomed us all. And I think he went further than just us as farmers, but white people in general, and he declared that we are all, all Zimbabweans and we all have a future here. I think it's the outworking of that that is the challenge, and hopefully that, is, as, as you said, as we uh, make the best of the current situation and use the, the abilities that we have and uh, reach out with uh, hands that are willing to be part of Team Zimbabwe, hopefully that will become a greater reality in, in, the, in, in our experience. Just going back to putting everything on my shoulders, <laughs> I, would, I have to say that um, since Honourable Dr. Masuka became Minister of Agriculture, I have a, he has granted me an open door on many occasions. I would phone him and say, Honourable Minister, there's an issue I need to talk to you. And he would say, come and see me at 6 o'clock tomorrow morning. And that, is, that has happened. Uh, so I do believe that we, have, we are no longer seen as the enemy of the state. And even and as I alluded to in my address, we are, we are included. We are consulted. Um, Professor Jiri will, is well aware of that. And I think that... Uh, as far as the bridge goes, I think the bridge is there. I think the reality is that there's uh, only so much that our limited uh, team and I myself are able to, to do. There's only so much that few of us can do. I'm hoping that we will be able to grow and we will have the people who will be able to part, be fully involved in the interaction with government. Um, and uh, probably the relationship between the CFU and the Ministry of, La of Agriculture would be stronger if I had more time to invest in it. But it is strong, and the minister, I know, uh, I, have, I do have his ear if necessary. And I'm, I'm confident that we are not the enemy of the state. I'm confident that we have a part to play. Um, and Professor Jiri, thank you for staying. I hope you're able to convey the essence of what Alan was talking about. Um, he is one of our members who has definitely got involved in the situation as we find ourselves in. He's doing his best. He's a highly productive farmer in very diff difficult and trying circumstances, as are many of our members. So we are playing our part, and uh, we would... Uh, we look forward to an environment where it becomes easier. I think that is, the, that is the key here. And easier not only for us, but all of Zimbabweans, especially in the agriculture sector. So I think, um, does anybody want to make any comments or, uh, on Alan's address to us? Anybody have any insights that they would like to share? 
uh, that maybe Professor Jerry can take back to the minister. Well, it looks like um, there's nothing more to be said. So I think part of the, the normal proceedings at uh, the CFU Congress is the presentation of the Farming Oscar. This year, for many reasons, we didn't uh, manage to come up with a, with a candidate. I think m most of us who normally are involved in that process were stretched beyond our limits with other things that we're dealing with. So. There is no Farming Oscar presentation this year. I'm sure there are deserving candidates somewhere out there, but uh, uh, for the, this year we, we have, we're not making an award, and hopefully next year we'll be uh, in a position to award the Farming Oscar again. So on that note, all that remains for me is to thank all of you for attending. Thank you to the CFU staff and for Sabre Business World for uh, hosting us and for our sound and technical team for putting together the, the link, the online link. Um, and uh, yeah, um, we look forward to hopefully an easier year, a much more productive year. And um, I know we have elections which are, which are looming for our, in our nation. That is always uh, a tense time um, I think we need to be wise in how we conduct ourselves as farmers who are on the land and also those who are asking for and not asking, waiting and working towards getting our compensation. The years when politics take the principal place on stage um, mean that other probably much more important issues get sidelined. And uh, we as the CSC are well aware of that. So we are uh, going as carefully as we can to make sure that whatever comes out in this current period is, is uh, something that will be of benefit to, to our farmers. Um, but the reality is that uh, yeah, things are, we're entering a, a season of uh, uh, electioneering, election campaigning. Certainly our prayer is that it will be a, a peaceful and free and fair election that will enable us to move forward as a democracy with a bit more maturity than we've had in the past. Well, with those comments, I would like to thank you for attending and declare this the 79th uh, Annual Congress of the Commercial Farmers Union closed. Thank you, everyone. There is um, supposed to be snacks out there, hey, for those of you who uh, are present. And there's a cash bar. Okay. For the councillors, we have our customary post-Congress council meeting quickly. We want to do that quickly so that uh, the formalities are taken care of. <laughs>